It's the Opperman Report. And now, here is investigator Ed Opperman. Okay, welcome to the Opperman Report. I'm your host, private investigator Ed Opperman. You can find me at Opperman Investigations and Digital Forensic Consulting through my website, emailrevealer.com. You can contact me at uh, oppermaninvestigations at gmail.com. And uh, you can e- yeah, email me at uh, yeah, oppermaninvestigations at gmail.com. I'm really excited about our guest today. You know him as the QAnon Shaman. Uh, his real name is Jake Angeli. Uh, he's got a website called ForbiddenTruthAcademy.com. Now, you can find him on Twitter at America Shaman on Twitter. He's written a couple of books, One Mind at a Time, A Deep State of Illusion, and a Will and Power uh, Inside the... Uh, living library. Living library. Living library. My own handwriting is so terrible, man. But Jake Angeli, man, tell us about yourself. Who is Jake Angeli? Well, um, I'm definitely not the straw man that the media has made me out to be. That's for sure. Um, uh, the media used my face, my name, my image to create a shock and awe campaign and uh, then use that shock and awe campaign to uh, smear me, to smear the people that were there on January 6th, to smear Trump supporters. Um, so what's funny about that, though, is that if they would have done their homework, if they would have done their due diligence, they would understand how big of a mistake that actually was <laughs> because I'm nothing like what the caricature that they tried to make me out to be. They tried to make me out to be some, you know, idiot, some lunatic fringe uh, extremist. And no, nothing could be further from the truth. I'm not a white supremacist. I'm not a white nationalist. I'm not a terrorist or a, uh, an, a, a extremist of any sorts. I'm actually centrist. I'm a libertarian. <laughs> you know, I'm a constitutional uh, – I'm a believer in the Constitution. I'm a, I believe in the Constitutional Republic. I believe in our, the vision that our founders had for our country. And I think that there's a very – clearly nefarious force at this point that is working in the opposite direction that our founders were working in so long ago, trying to create a one world government, a new world order. Mm-hmm. And well, I'm, I'm doing my best to be the antithesis of that. But then let me ask you this, because you, you say that they, they mischaracterized you, um, but you're the one that showed up there in that outfit. You know what I mean? Uh, what is, let's start with this. Um, who were you before January 6th? I know you were some kind of an activist in Arizona, right? So what was your life back before January 6th? Well, I'm, I'm a spiritual activist, not a political one. I believe that our socioeconomic and geopolitical systems are so corrupt and distorted because our spiritual perspective, our spiritual institutions have become so corrupt and distorted. And so our our socioeconomic and geopolitical systems are a reflection of that spiritual distortion and corruption. Now, in Arizona, I was, uh, yes, a spiritual activist going down to my local capitals, going down to my local media buildings, going down to the local power company when they were ripping people off um, and, pro- and protesting, doing my shamanic thing, bringing my drum, singing my song down at the ley lines at the Capitol, outside of the media building uh, here in downtown Phoenix, um, outside of APS, the power company. One time I did that. Uh, anyway, um, I, but in the... in you know, for my day job, Hmm. I was working in group homes with teen boys. So I I did that for six and a half years because working with children, helping kids in in basically saving and helping the next generation is what I'm all about. Now, when you were doing this activity back in Arizona, because one of the names you use is lone wolf, uh, were you like a lone wolf? Were you a part of a group? Well, that was the, that that was the pen name that I used for the book uh, Will and Power, you know, inside the Living Library, and there's a reason for that, um, and and you'll find that out because it's a part of a book series that I'm uh, I have the second book for that series written. I just haven't had it edited yet, and I haven't published it yet. But um, the you, the name I was using on my YouTube channel was Yellowstone Wolf. Right now. 
Um, are you familiar with the what's called a trophic cascade and the effects of the wolves in Yellowstone? Absolutely not. <laughs> I'm from the Bronx. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. So check this out, and yeah. then we'll kind of bring this back yeah. to spiritual activism and you know the the outfit, the the regalia. Yeah. So in Yellowstone National Park, as the frontier began to expand and people started moving west and they started developing cattle ranches and stuff like that wolves began to be a problem when they when these ranches were like bordering yellowstone and stuff like that so the government and the uh people decided that they were going to get rid of all the wolves in yellowstone national park so there became this campaign to hunt them down and kill them so for like 70 years or so there was no wolves in yellowstone national park and the effects on the ecosystem were catastrophic because there were no wolves in the ecosystem. The elk and the deer and stuff like that were coming out of the forest and into the canyons. They were eating all of the foliage. Um, and this is the same foliage that like little critters like, you know, mice or frogs or beavers or what have you would use to like hide from predators, whether they be coyotes or they be eagles or they be bears or what have you. And so, uh, and also because the foliage was being consumed so rapidly, the roots weren't able to grow and develop and like interlock with one another and create stability in the root structure and in the soil composition in the ecosystem. So what ended up happening is that there was mass migrations out of Yellowstone National Park or in some cases even mass extinctions because the foliage was being consumed the little critters were being eaten the uh coyotes were hunting and replacing basically the the, the wolves in that sense um but they were far more uh, indiscriminate with their selection of who and what they ate and hunted um the foliage was uh not growing thick enough so what would happen is that as rain would come the river banks would collapse and uh, because the the soil and the and the roots weren't very strong and tightly knit together so the whole ecosystem began to collapse and uh Shortly thereafter, like, like I said, like 70 years later, the people finally realized, you know, maybe there was something to these wolves mm. being in the ecosystem. So the wolf is the apex predator in Yellowstone National Park. And when they allowed the wolves to go back into the ecosystem, within a few months, the whole ecosystem changed because the wolves chased out the elk and the deer out of the canyons and into the forests again. And then this allowed the foliage to grow. As the foliage began to grow, these other critters, these smaller critters came back and they started to do their thing. Uh, the beaver would build dams. The dams would end up creating smaller pools of water that little minnows or frogs or mice or what have you would end up occupying. Um, so in this sense, the, the beavers being there changed the courses of the rivers. The, and also what changed the courses of the rivers is the plants and the foliage was allowed to grow. The roots were able to interconnect with each other. And the, the soil composition was much, much stronger so that when it did rain, then the, the riverbanks wouldn't collapse. So the riverbanks became more narrow in their channels. More water was able to directly flow in a, in a specific path. The beavers built their dams. The little pools of water began to form. Then, you know, the eagles started coming back. The, the bears began, uh, became uh, more prevalent in the ecosystem. The wolves would also kill the coyotes as opposed to uh, the coyotes eating all these lower life forms, all these smaller creatures, the wolves would kill the coyotes. Oh, okay, and but, but so Jake, what I'm, what I'm eating up all the time of the whole show, uh, like, like what's the... Well, I, yeah. I, I, I know, I, I'm getting there, I'm yeah. getting there. So the point is this, the point is this, the wolves being at the top of the food chain is what created what is called this trophic cascade, where the, the apex predator being at the top of the food chain ends up affecting the ecosystem and allowing it to function properly. So I call myself Yellowstone... Well, I, I got the name Yellowstone Wolf because in the spiritual ecosystem, in the ether, I'm, I'm, I'm the apex predator. Gotcha. And, 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 back, and back, back to Arizona, though, were you acting uh, alone or with, with a group? Oh, no, I was all uh, – well, I mean, I'm never alone. God and the angels are with me right. always. So um, I was going with God and the angels everywhere I went, 
but nobody could see them. It, it looked like it was just me. <laughs> and, and, and you used to show up like at Black Lives Matter protests and, and uh, school board things too as well? Um, yeah, I showed up to Black Lives Matter and Antifa protests as a counter protester marching with the police. I tried to red pill those people, but they were totally not interested whatsoever. Mm. Um, so after a while, I decided that as long as they're not attacking police officers and destroying property like they were in Portland and Minneapolis and stuff like that, then I have no reason to be there uh, to try to stop those things from happening. Um, as long as they're not attacking police officers, I have no reason to be there to stop that from happening. So, um, yeah, and I went to other things, uh, other rallies and stuff, Trump rallies. I went to walk away rallies. I, at pretty much every rally in 2020 that was in Arizona, pretty much all of them I went to. And this was always you showed up in that outfit with the bison horns. Yeah, my the, regalia. Yeah. yeah, yeah, my regalia, yeah. So the whole thing is behind the shamanic regalia is it all has symbolism, okay? So the symbolism is that in the Diné, or Navajo, we call them Navajo, they call themselves Diné. In the Diné tradition, the coyote is like the trickster or like the deceiver. Mm. And so I'm where I have the trickster by the tails. It's coyote tails and coyote fur. So I have the trickster by the tails. And mm. I'm wearing the trickster skin because if the trickster messes with the buffalo, they get the horns. You see? So um, you can't pull the wool over my eye. Gotcha. It's, it's just not going to happen. You and then what, I mean? what about the spear, though? And, and and the and it would say Q sent me, right? Well, you were an advocate of the Q anon drops. Well, the staff that I was carrying around was not intended in any way, shape, or form to be a weapon. It was not really a spear as much as it was a, a like a a staff. Okay. Um, now, yeah, I I had a sign that said Q sent me on the other side. It said Hold the line, Patriots. God wins. Um, and the Q drops, I think, are a evolution in our collective consciousness because of the way that they affected the mind and the psychology of our country and the world. It basically circumvented the Operation Mockingbird media and gave the counter narrative to the divisive narrative that was pushed by the media, the Mockingbird media. Um, it exposed the debt-based fiat currency. It exposed child and human trafficking. And it exposed the way that blackmail is used to create centralized control in our government, kind of like with what Jeffrey Epstein was doing. So in my opinion, the Q operation was largely a success mm -hmm. in that sense. And, and you still have positive feelings about the Q operation. Well, yeah, I mean, and you think it was authentic. You, you think it, it was a really picture. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but you think it was authentic. You think it was a real uh, insider with the top level security clearance who was dropping these uh, hints. I think it was a bunch. I mm. think it was a, a group of people. But yes, I believe it was people at the highest levels of military intelligence and mm. the intelligence community disseminating above top secret information to patriots in our republic so that we could take back our country from communists, globalists, fascists who have infiltrated our government at some of the highest and lowest levels so that they could bring the United States down from within. They knew that they could not you know, take us down with standing armies, so they had to infiltrate the system and bring it down from within. And so Q was uh, an operation designed to expose all of that and shift the collective consciousness of the nation. Gotcha. Now, and you described your, your outfit in very elaborate terms. It was almost like a, a cultish kind of a metaphysical type, of, uh, giving you some kind of a you had a whole thing going on there, right? You had a whole, there's, there's a, a reason for every shred of outfit on you there, right? Now, I was told when you first showed up on the scene that some of your tattoos uh, were like Norse or Nordic type tattoos. Can you describe that to me? Yeah, sure. So um, let's start with all of my tattoos are shamanic in nature. They're all earned tattoos, kind of like how military members wear ribbons on their chest to um, – commemorate or to symbolize the accomplishments that they have made i have tattoos in shamanic cultures the tattoos are worn to commemorate or to display the things that have either been overcome or accomplished on behalf of the individual um, all of my tattoos have symbolism they're all earned tattoos the nordic tattoos um, i have mjolnir hammer of thor as on my lower abdomen i have yidrasil 
the world tree or the tree of life over my heart because I'm here to defend all life on this planet. I'm here to defend all realms um, of life. And um, the one above that is called the Valk Knot or Odin's Knot. There's a lot of right. debate as to whether or not what Odin's Knot means. Some people think it means heaven and hell and earth. Some people believe it symbolizes the nine realms. Other people believe it's a portal. Um, it's on the tomb of Viking warriors that died honorably in battle without fear and got to go to Valhalla. And and when you say these are awarded tattoos, but these are self-awarded. You awarded yourself these tattoos. No one else was above you doing this. Well, I was self-initiated into my shamanic path, but like I said, God and the angels gotcha. have been with me every step of the way. So when I have earned one of these tattoos – then it is made clear to me in, I got through spiritual means. Now, now what about, because uh, people have told me that these tattoos on you are similar to the tattoos that the Christ Church shooter had. You, 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 know, you know who I'm talking about? Um, are you talking about that dude? Yeah, that shot, shot the whole uh, island. Yeah, of all those kids and stuff. Yeah, that he had the same kind of tattoos. Well, I haven't heard that. Okay. But, um, you know, here's the thing, dude. Look at it like this. All throughout history, symbols of power have drawn the attention and have been used by people that seek more power. Okay, I don't seek power. I don't seek status. I don't seek, you know, fortune. What I seek is purpose. What I seek is making a difference. And so if you look at, for example, the swastika, for a long, long time, thousands and thousands of years, that was a symbol of peace amongst cultures all over the planet. But what did Adolf Hitler do? A man seeking power took this symbol of power and this symbol of peace, and he he inverted it, and then he twisted it, and he made it a symbol for war and division. Gotcha. Okay? So, so, wait, so, wait, so you wouldn't say that you have the same beliefs as the Christchurch shooter? Hell no. <laughs> okay, all right. Just trying to get Now, um, I'm curious now. How did you, how did you, well, first of all, what inspired you to go to Washington, D.C. on January 6th? How did you get there? Did you go with a friend or a group who paid for all this? How did you wind up over there? Well, you know, I got there by the divine grace of God, I'll tell you that much, because I really didn't have the means of transportation or mm -hmm. financial means to get myself there, especially on January 6th. Um, but what's interesting is that, I mean, I also went on December 12th for the second MAGA Million March okay. that was there in D.C. And similar story, man, like the synchronicities that occurred in order to get me from A to B were absolutely incredible. And it's things like these synchronicities that it's like, OK, God, I know that you're with me. I know that you're watching. I'm just going to trust you. <laughs> so you don't think it's possible that some kind of a nefarious uh, intelligence agency kind of, you know, because you, you talk about how the Mockingbird press uh, twisted your beliefs in your, your your presentation you don't think it's possible that you were delivered over there in some kind of way uh, uh against your intentions no 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 i i i, I know i dude there's so many synchronicities so many so much crazy stuff that happened before january 6th so many miraculous things that okay. occurred before that date that all of these synchronicities that happened to get me from A to B, either in December or in January, were just a part of a long string of beautiful and incredible miraculous synchronicities that, to me, were evidence of God, you know, being with me on my path. Okay, so no, no guy in a trench coat befriended you shortly before and handed you money. <laughs> Is it taking that? No, <laughs> okay, nothing, no like nothing like that. Like that. Okay, nothing that obvious, anyway. But you know, you don't think that there's any kind of a. Uh, uh, well, it would be a mistake for them to do something like that. If their if their goal is to destroy the country, then why would they why would they choose a guy that could literally dismantle the deep state in five minutes mm -hmm. with words? Why would they choose him to be the straw man? Now you get there. There there are photographs of you like the night before with Rudy Giuliani. That wasn't the night before. That was in Arizona. Oh, really? That was when he was, yeah, that was when he was uh, here in Arizona exposing the uh, election rigging here in Arizona. I think that was sometime in either November or December. I can't remember. I think it was sometime in December. And besides that picture, did you have any contact with him? No. I just got into there. I got into the to the to the lecture or the, the presentation. He was about to sit down and wow. start on his, you know, the second part of his presentation. I said, hey, do you mind if I get a picture really quick? He's like, yeah, sure. All right, let's do it. 
And so if you look at the picture, he's not even looking at the camera. I'm shaking his hand. I'm looking at the camera going, oh, hell yeah. Right. And he's like looking over off in another direction. It was a t- it was two seconds. I never even actually talked to the guy. Now, what happens when you do it? It's, it's like a vote uh, election uh, rigging uh, presentation. What happens when a guy like you walks in there with that outfit? But I didn't have the outfit on. Oh, there wasn't. Oh, no. On. Oh, OK. I thought I did see an outfit. OK, I'm sorry. It's been so long. Uh, now, the day, though, now, well, one thing that always struck me about the photographs of you inside the Capitol. First of all, how'd you get inside? Well, because there was a riot. <laughs> <laughs> like, people broke in the building. That's how. And I walked through the open doors that they broke into the building with. Gotcha. And- I, I walked through those open doors. But, I mean, when I got into the Senate chamber, that's because I was escorted there by the police because I offered to help them. I told them there were people in the Senate chamber. I said, if you want, I can go in there and help you guys, like, make sure nobody steals anything or vandalizes any property. Nobody's violent. You know, I can even help you clear the clear the room if you want. And they're like, yeah, come on, let's go. You got your megaphone? Let's do this. Because they considered you like a leader? Well, no. I just – I, I – I came to them because it was my intention to ensure everything was peaceful right. on that day, especially in that sacred building. The Capitol building, along with all the other Washington monuments, uh, are built on electromagnetic ley lines that are equivalent to, like, temples of sorts. So because they're built on ley lines, because they're equivalent to, like, modern-day temples, I wanted to ensure that everything that happened inside that building was peaceful and calm, that there was no chaos, no violence, no bloodshed. As soon as you walked into the building, though, you, you stood out from everybody else. You, you, you garnered a lot of attention, and a lot of photographers came to you. Uh, you didn't bring your own photographer with you, did you? <laughs> no. Because some of these, uh, it seems like you're posing for a lot of these photos. Well, you know, um, I'm just really photogenic, I guess. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> okay, and, and, and oftentimes they'd be taking a picture of you, and it would look like you were shouting. Uh, but were you actually yeah, shouting? I, or, I, yeah. Yeah, I was I was screaming freedom okay. or I was singing my shamanic song. One or the other. What do you make of the the participation of Capitol Police? Do you think they were in on this? Um, if you look into the testimony of uh Tariq Johnson, the uh Capitol Police officer that was the one that evacuated the Senate and was trying to evacuate the House. Yeah. Uh and what he said is actually there's a interview uh, or the spaces I did with him on my Twitter or on my X account. Um if you go to my page, uh, he talks about a woman named Yogananda Pittman being the chief intelligence officer for the Capitol Police and um, the role that she played along with her like underling, a woman named Julie Farnham, I believe is her name, um, and how the these people suppressed intelligence and suppress the information about there being possible violence and a riot or something at the Capitol. They did not give it to Chief Sun. Um, the gentleman, the, the chief of police for Capitol Police that um, recently did an interview with Tucker Carlson, they suppressed that intelligence. They didn't get it to him. So Chief Sun had no idea. And Yogananda Pittman refused to allow the National Guard to come in, that she refused to allow the uh, um, the chambers to be evacuated. She was not conversing whatsoever with Tariq Johnson as he's like begging her and like pleading with her to please let them evacuate the chambers. Um, if it wasn't for uh, Officer Johnson, there would have been senators in the Senate chamber when I was in the building. And then at that point, there would be individuals that were would be allowed to use deadly force. Yeah. So I think that and this is just my opinion. I think people like Pelosi and McConnell, people like uh, the intelligence agencies that knew all this stuff was going to go down, people like Yogananda Pittman and Julie Farnham, I think that they wanted the bloodshed. I think that they wanted the congressman to be put in danger so that it could look as bad as humanly possible for Trump and his supporters. Well, then, then what was the goal of the supporters? It wasn't to interfere with the counting of the electors? I don't know why people were doing what they're doing, man. (laughs) You know, um, if you look into the situation, uh, 
there was clearly BLM and Antifa in the crowd really? that were there to agitate and do and do harm. Um, there's people that uh, uh, were feds that were in the crowd that were inciting the breaking of the law and and all sorts of other things. Um, they were you know egging people on, and that's no that's no surprise. That's not the first time the feds have done stuff like that and then arrested people. Um, so if you ask me what the purpose of it was, I probably couldn't tell you because I had no idea that it was even going to happen. Well, Jake Angeli, let me ask you this, because you've been accused of doing that same thing, that you were in collusion with Ray Epps to make everybody look bad. Uh, what do you make of that then? Well, I'll say this much. Part of psychological warfare operations is muddying the water obscuring the truth that way when the real information the true information is out there there's so much disinformation and misinformation that nobody knows what to believe right i think that uh the reason why people think that is because they are terrified of the fact that they don't know what the hell is going on and that scares them a lot they, so they try to piece together in their minds the most likely scenario based on the very little information that they have I would say that if anybody wants to try to compare me to Ray Epps, I would say look at the treatment that Ray Epps got in the in mm -hmm. the media and by the government and then parallel that and contrast that with the treatment that I got in the media and the treatment that I got from the government. Or meaning that you actually it's went to prison. Yeah, you actually went to prison. Yeah, Ray Epps has been barely questioned. <laughs> well, and, 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 and the media yeah. has gone out to bat for this guy. Yeah. The media tried to destroy me. The government, the government said all sorts of stuff about me that that they should have been saying about Ray Epps. Do you think this was an attempted coup? You know, I saw a meme that I thought was pretty funny. Uh, it said uh, January sixth. Will and this is the this is the meme. Uh, it said January sixth will forever go down in history as the day that the government staged a riot to cover up a clearly fraudulent election. Gotcha. So you still believe that the the election uh, was rigged? Dude, every American election since 1913 has been rigged. It's not an election process. It's a selection process. And if we understand the way that the deep state works, how it relates to fiat currency, how it relates to child and human trafficking and blackmail, how it relates to people like Jeffrey Epstein or things like the Council on Foreign Relations, the Bilderberg Group, the Fed, the Federal Reserve Bank, you know, all of these things. If we understand the real inner workings of the system, then it becomes quite clear that we do not live in a constitutional republic anymore. We do not live in a quote unquote democracy. OK, and we never lived in a democracy. We live in a constitutional republic. But the, the point is, is that that constitutional republic has been suspended over and over and over again, because when you have a state of an emergency, the, if the feds declare a state of emergency, then the Constitution goes out the window. OK, so they're going to continue to create states of, nat of national emergency so that they can keep throwing the Constitution out the window. And that's what we have. That's what we've been dealing with for some time. They create crisis after crisis after crisis. And each time they do, they centralize power more and more and more to the bureaucratic state, to the authoritarian centralized power state. Now, if I'm not mistaken, though, at one point you were willing to testify against Trump at the impeachment hearings. That was something that my previous attorney said to the media. Okay. My previous attorney did and said all sorts of things on my behalf without my knowledge and my consent. Gotcha. Okay, then let me ask you this. Okay, so we have January 6th, and they splashed you all over the place. You did stick out, okay? But they splashed you all over the place with these very well-taken photos, very photogenic, like you said. Uh, okay, I suspected they had a, you brought your own photographer or some kind of professional photographer has found you, you know, and, and you know, Really? No, what happened yeah. is that there was a bunch of media members. There was a bunch of media members inside of the uh, building because they were certifying the election. Right. So because there was a bunch of media members already inside the building because they were certifying the election, there was all these professional media members inside the building when, you know, everything took place and when everything went down. Gotcha. How soon after that day did you realize, hey, um, I might be getting arrested? 
Uh, well, when I found out the FBI was looking for me on the on January seventh, I I pretty much figured that that might be the case. But, now they said they were only looking for me for misdemeanors, and I was under the impression that the FBI didn't waste their time on misdemeanors. I guess I was wrong. Um, you know, so I, I just, as far as I knew, uh, I was just going to turn myself in for questioning. Right. And um, you know, they told me they weren't going to arrest me, and I naively believed them. And you went in without a lawyer? That is correct. When you went in to talk to the FBI, were you wearing that outfit? <laughs> no. Okay. No, I, was, <laughs> I gotta ask. I was, no, no. That that is, yeah. that's reserved for gotcha. ceremonial purposes for rallies and stuff like that. Okay, but you I know, gotta it's, ask, it's right? Come on. <laughs> something I wear all the time. I gotta ask. That's okay, fun. you're not wearing it now, by the way. I just seen him off on video for a few minutes ago. He's not wearing it. It's just very, very professionally. Now, um, yeah, it's 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 not something I wear all the time. Gotcha. So you go in there and you're talking to the FBI. Uh, what what are their questions like? Did they think you were like leadership? That you were leading this mob? That you were leading well, yeah, the they, Proud they were Boys? Asking, the Oath Keepers? Yeah, they were asking things like, "Are you a member of the Proud Boys? Right. Are you a member of the Oath Keepers?" No, I'm not. No, I'm not. You know, uh, they they were just probing and asking questions. I, you know, I had the truth on my side. I just gave them the truth. I told them exactly what happened. Exactly how things went down for me personally on that day. Well, then tell and tell me the how, what did you what did you admit to doing that day? Just the doors are open, you walked in. Yeah, and then I told him that I was walking around uh, with the police trying to help them clear people out. I told him that I told everybody to go home. I stopped people from breaking in the building, et cetera, et cetera. Ultimately, what were the charges against you? Oh, it was a couple of misdemeanors like trespassing, parading on Capitol grounds, um, stuff like that. And then the two felonies were one was basically like a rioting charge. And then the other one was obstruction of an official proceeding. Mm, OK. And then uh, do you turn yourself in? Yeah, I, I called them uh, when I found out the FBI was looking for me. I called them and said, I heard you guys were looking for me. I heard you wanted information on me. Let's talk. So the same so day I they question you, they arrest you. With no attorney. No, 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 no. I was. I talked to them on the phone. I think I was on the seventh and the eighth, and we scheduled a meeting for January 9th, and that was when they arrested me. It was on January 9th. And you turned yourself in, or they came and got you? No, no. I turned. I, I turned myself in. I didn't realize at the time that I was "quote unquote" turning myself in. Right. I asked the guy I, that I was on the phone with. I was just be honest with me. Are you going to arrest me? You know, and he lied to me. Um, he told me no. Which I told him at the time. I said, "Dude, just be real with me. I'll still turn myself in. Yeah. And I'll still go to the questioning if you just tell me. I just want to know that way I can, you know, you feed your dog. Yeah, feed my dog. You know, put out the cat. You know, that kind yeah, of stuff, exactly. right? You know, exactly. You know, yeah. and and in that sense, the guy was kind of a dick. Yeah, you know, he should have told me. He should have said, "Yes, we're going to arrest you. Sorry, but we got to do our job." And I would have said, "Okay, cool. I'll show up. I'll see you in the morning." Uh, up until that point, do you think your biggest regret is not having an attorney and just keeping your mouth shut? Nope. No? Okay. Because I have the truth on my side. I'm not trying to worm my way out of anything, you know. Um, and uh, I think if if anything, I just – the attorney that I had uh, during all of this process was a really bad one. I have a much better attorney now, but the attorney that I, uh, that I had – during this whole process was, in my opinion, a terrible attorney. How'd you find him? He found me. Oh, boy. He contacted my mother and basically said he would do it all pro bono, that he'd been doing this for over 30 years as a federal defense attorney, blah, 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 blah. And, uh, you know, the rest is history. And, and did he say that he was like a shared your beliefs and shared your uh, your partisan yeah, yeah oh yeah, yeah yeah he said he believed in the constitution said he was a trump supporter and all this other stuff which i came to find out later from other people that that wasn't the case that he is like he donated to a bunch of democrats and you know that uh he was basically like uh, all about you know doing his little you know, shtick on the media and in, in front of the camera and you know i i think personally that he just used my uh recognition as oh, an opportunity sure. to themselves. Yeah, you you were a poster poster child there, you know. Uh, now, were you able to raise any money? Did, you know, did people come forward to, to help support you? Uh, yes and no. I mean, I've heard a lot of people have, uh, you know, 
made a lot more money than I ever got donated to me. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hard to believe, yeah. right? You got something like Jenna Ellis raises like a hundred thousand overnight. Here, the QAnon shaman, you're like the the big guy there, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm not, the the best part about all this is that I'm not interested in yeah. profit. I'm interested in purpose. I chase purpose, not profit. So as long as the purpose can be fulfilled, and that is the freedom of humanity, the freedom of the United States of America, the saving of the seventh generation of the planet, well, then I've done my job, and I'm a rich man. Now, you, you go over there. You, you, you don't realize you're turning yourself in, but it turns out you're turning yourself in. How long are you in custody? No, oh, I was in custody for a total of 27 months. They they did not allow me out. They said I was a dangerous society and a flight risk, which doesn't make any sense in my personal opinion because I didn't do anything violent on that day, and I called the FBI as soon as they I found out they were looking for me, and I turned myself in. How is that a flight risk? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I have no criminal history, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I just think what it was is that if they would have let the poster child that they chose to, you know, exploit, if they, if they would have let me go – then the media would have been up in arms. The government would have looked really weak and bad. I, I really don't know what the deal is. I have a lot of respect for Judge Lambert, the the judge that was my judge. But I that doesn't agree with that doesn't mean I agree with all the decisions that he made. Yeah, just think if he would have showed up that day without the makeup, without the horns, it's another guy. Well, you know, man, I uh, I just do what God asked me to do. Yeah. Now, uh, so now, what happens now? You go to trial, you plead guilty. What happens? I took a plea deal. You see, the feds have a 98-something yeah. percent. <laughs> I'm well aware of uh, that, man. I'm well aware of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's because they, they weigh on you with all the resources, yeah. the endless resources of the government. You know, they, they, they lock people up. They keep them detained for up to three years. They make their lives miserable until they just plead guilty. Yeah, 98% conviction rate. They, they threaten to arrest your family members, all kind of stuff. In fact, sometimes they do arrest your family members. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, like, it's like communist China. It's like the Stasi. Well, it's like you know the, the, the KGB over in Soviet Union. This, at this point, we're living in a fascist. Well, yeah, it's not like it's, it's United States of America doing this. <laughs> it's capitalism doing this. It's not like anything else. It's, what, it's what's doing it. So, well, but it's, but it's yeah. not capitalism. It's not. It's not capitalism because let's talk about the deep state really quick okay. if we still have the time. No, we have to 15 um, minutes. Okay, so check it out. The deep state can be described as tyranny. The founders of our nation divided our government into three separate branches, legislative, executive, and judicial, law creating, law enforcing, law adjudicating. And they separated these powers and they gave them checks and balances because our founders were dealing with tyranny, which they define tyranny as the, the centralizing of all three of these branches of government into a centralized power that is under the crown, like what they were dealing with. The crown owned and controlled the law enforcement Enforcement. They, the crown created law, and the crown also owned and controlled the courts. So that's tyranny. Now, the bureaucracy. The bureaucracy is largely what the deep state is. The bureaucracy has the ability to quote unquote regulate commerce, and through these quote unquote regulations, they are in a one way or another able to create law because these laws say what we can buy, what we can sell, what is legal, what is illegal. Okay. Now, the bureaucratic agencies also have their own law enforcement agencies that enforce these regulations. So now we have law creating, legislative, we have law enforcing, executive, and these bureaucratic agencies also have their own administrative courts that are outside of the federal system. That's law adjudicated. That is tyranny. They all of, and there's over 500 federal agencies, bureaucratic agencies that are in charge of quote unquote regulating commerce. So now, the other as, uh, aspect or apparatus to the deep state and to the bureaucracy is this. The corporations that the government bureaucratic agencies are supposed to be regulating are actually working with the bureaucratic agencies and are writing the regulations for the bureaucratic agencies so that the corporations can maintain their monopolies over our resources, over our labor, over our system and our economy. 
So the corporations or and even the banking uh, cartels are using these bureaucratic agencies, whether it be the Fed, whether it be the SEC, whether it be the FCC, whether it be the FDA, the NIH, the DEA, the FBI, you name it, CIA. What they're doing is they're using these bureaucratic agencies to use the government's monopoly on the initiation of force to reinforce their corporate or their banking monopolies over our resources, our labor, and our financial institutions. So these international corporations and these international banks are using our national government and our national bureaucratic agencies to enforce their will on the people. And this is fascism, because fascism is the illusion of a free market. It's the illusion of government regulations and the government regulating corporations. When in fact, what a fascism is, is it is corporate interests and government interests melding together to create essentially a dictatorship where the government and the corporate the uh, entities are controlling the economy and enslaving the people. So this is the deep state. This is why I mentioned things like the Council on Foreign Relations, the Bilderberg Group, why I mentioned things like the World Economic Forum so often, why it is that I mentioned things like the UN, the WHO, the CDC, the IMF, International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, et cetera, the Fed, the Federal Reserve, because all of these things are different apparatuses, BlackRock, Vanguard. They are the different gears within this much larger, what JFK called a tightly knit, highly efficient machine. But, but, but... And there's people like Dr. Fauci at the highest levels of all of these bureaucratic agencies, these 500 bureaucratic agencies, or somebody like Fauci at the tippy top of all of these pyramids that is controlling everything within these pyramids and moving it toward the new world order, one world government that the globalists are what I call the less than one percenters, because that's what they are. They're less than one percent of the population. These less than one percenters are trying to create this new world order, one world government where they control and own all the resources, labor and financial systems around the planet. But, but uh, for profit, for capitalism. But it's not capitalism. That's not capitalism. Capitalism is the best idea wins. Capitalism is the, the best invention wins. Capitalism is the free market. We're not living in a free market because things like a cure for cancer, things like Tesla Tower technology, things like zero point energy engines, or even just engines that run off of water or hydrogen. All of these things have been suppressed. Alternative forms of me uh, medicine have been suppressed. Alternative forms of transportation right. have been suppressed. Because they're making money. So that's, not, that's, not <laughs> because they're, that's not capitalism. Because they're profiting off of the energy system we have now. They're profiting off the, 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 the profit but based. But it's not uh, capitalism. Okay, we, you know what? But that's not capitalism. Let's have you come back. Because the government is enforcing because the government is enforcing the will of the corporations. It's not capitalism. Jake, Angeli, let's have you come back. Let's uh, let's have that whole discussion. I would love to have that with you. Uh, I would love to. I know. Yeah, I like it. I like it a lot. Uh, what is ForbiddenTruthAcademy.com? dot com? ForbiddenTruthAcademy.com is a place where people can go and get a bunch of free information that breaks down the spiritual nature to reality and how that the institutions that we currently are using, socioeconomic and geopolitical systems, are based off of um, a distorted view of spiritual reality of the objective reality um we talk about spirituality we talk about sacred geometry we talk about what i call the divine matrix and we also talk about what i call the death matrix which is this full spectrum dominance system that the less than one percenters have used and have created so that they can play god with our lives so um like for example we talk about um, psychological warfare. We talk about the deep state. We talk about history. We talk about, um, you know, suppressed technologies like, uh, you know, Tesla Tower technology. We talk about Dr. Reif and his machine. We talk about the TR3B, the patents that Donald Trump just released in 2020, the TR3B, the zero point energy engine and uh, the room temperature superconductor. The, these things were applied for by a guy named Salvador Pius. You can look these up up, up online. I mean, they, they're, they're public knowledge at this point. The patents are available to be checked out online. Um, they are declassified. And there's over five to 6,000 patents that have been classified by the government. And this is why I'm saying that we don't live in a capitalism, we live in a fascism, because these patents aren't allowed to get to the public. But everything on uh, Forbidden Truth Academy is free? Well, pretty much. Um, all of the courses are free. All, listening to the podcasts are free. You can also listen to all my interviews for free. And there is a, a portion of the page where you can request a consultation from me. And it is my 
suggestion that people digest all of the free content before they request a consultation, then I can help them with their spirituality, with their spiritual path. I can help them to grow and ascend spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically. Um, but it would be a lot easier and a lot more uh, effective for them if they would just watch all the free content before they request an hour's worth of my time during a consultation. And I do charge for the consultations. Gotcha. And it's a very professional website, ForbiddenTruthAcademy.com. Now, you say you have a podcast. What day does the podcast come out? Like, is it scheduled? Well, regularly the podcast scheduled? is it's on there. It's on there. Yeah. Um, the, currently, the podcast is on hold. There's some people that are involved with the podcast that are out of town. Um, uh, but we have over, I think it's like eight or nine episodes, maybe more than that, 10 episodes that are up on the uh, website. You can just go and click on it. It'll take you to the Rumble page. Forbidden Truth Podcast is the name of the podcast, Forbidden Truth Podcast. You can find it on ForbiddenTruthAcademy.com. What do you think is the biggest misconception? Um, by the way, do you still use that outfit occasionally? Well, the feds still have oh. my horns and they still have my cell phone. They still have my staff and, you know, the pants that I was wearing. Um, I'm trying to get all those things back, but they're being stubborn as mules about it so far as I can tell. Really? Um, because you think they would be religious? Oh, yeah. Dude, they were supposed to give it back over. Yeah. They were supposed to give it back over a year ago and they didn't. But, um, when it comes to, uh, you know, the outfit, it's a small part of a much bigger yeah. puzzle. Um, I was going to ask. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, yeah. What is the biggest misconception people have about uh, Jake Angeli? Um, I would say the biggest misconception is that I am somehow an extremist or um, a white supremacist or a racist or I'm a fed, I'm a plant, I'm an actor, a CIA asset, uh, that I'm mentally ill or that I'm schizophrenic. Uh, there's all these very real misconceptions based on disinformation that are out there. And I, I've tried to dispel it as much as I can. And I sometimes wonder if maybe it's just a bunch of feds on my Twitter proposing this BS because I've already answered a bunch of these questions in my Twitter uh, account and in my interviews. <laughs> no, there's definitely people out there on Twitter uh, that are, that are paid, you know, uh, operatives. Oh, yeah. you know, fucking forget. Um, what about, do you have like a family, a wife, kids? No, no wife and kids. Okay. And, and you're, you're back in Arizona now you're there. Cause now, uh, how long did you spend in prison? Um, 27 months total in prison, 10 and a half of which was in solitary confinement. Whoa. Now, what was the reason for that? Well, the government said it was because of COVID. Then they changed it over to the idea that I was in, quote, unquote, protective custody. Um, I think what it was was they were trying to make an example. I think they were trying to break me down personally because there were times where I was moved from the uh, prison or the, the jail that I was in. There was times where I was moved across the country, and I was in general population when I was moved. So did COVID and my safety go out the window when I was being moved? No. Obviously, well, obviously it did. And so what that means is that these were excuses. They weren't reasons. And they had you in this solitary confinement, this separate uh, confinement uh, before you pled guilty. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's really hard to, to, to justify how you would be classified for solitary confinement. You'd be just talking to you. You're a guy that can get along with people. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Yeah. yeah you have no violent history. That's really uh, – uh, Yeah. Yeah. It's it, But this is the thing, and this is why, like, we really need to, to step up and do something now because if this is how bad it's getting now and this is how bad it's been, imagine how bad it will be for our children and our children's children's children if we don't stand up and do something. And I'm not saying, you know – Violence. I don't believe in violence. I think that that's actually the antithesis of what we need. That's what the globalists and the feds want is people to get violent so they can label everybody as extremists. What we need to do is the Jesus Gandhi method, nonviolent, non-cooperation, the Martin Luther King Jr. method, civil disobedience, nonviolent, non-cooperation with evil and with evil systems. That's how we win. And you're endorsing Trump for uh, 2024? 
Well, I certainly like him a lot better than anybody else running for president. Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't say much. <laughs> that doesn't say much at all. Um, now, what about – aren't you well, – uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I'll just say, you know, there's a lot of things about Trump that I agree with. Yeah. There's a lot of things that he did that I believe – like if I were president, I would have done. But there's other things that he said and that he's done where I'm just like, man – why would you do that? Why would you say that? That uh, I don't agree with that. That doesn't make sense. But the thing is, this is America, and you know we're allowed to have differing opinions. And yeah. you know Trump is a smart man. I'm sure that he knows that the last thing that you want at your table is a bunch of yes men. They're gonna that are gonna kiss your rear end. That's the last thing that you want at the table. What you want is di- differing opinions so that the best ideas can win. Real quick, did you ever reach out for a pardon? Well, in the beginning, yeah, but it was not done, <laughs> and I can I can understand why. If he pardons me, and then he's going to have to pardon others. If he pardons others, then Lord knows that the uh, deep state apparatus, the intelligence agencies, the the lawfare attorneys, they're going to use whatever pardons that he gives to others as a tool against him in the future. Jake, we're out of time, okay? But you have an open invitation. You can come back anytime you want, okay, man? Uh, Jake, you just let me know, no, man. Definitely. Jake, Jake Angeli, uh, ForbiddenTruthAcademy.com. Now, he's written a couple of books. One Mind at a Time, uh, A Deep State of Illusion, right? Yep, the other, on Amazon. And the, the other one is uh, Will and Power Inside the Living Library. Yep, that one's written by uh, the pen name Lone Wolf, L-O-A-N-W-O-L-F. You can also find that one on Amazon. And on Twitter, you can find him at America, not American, America Shaman, S-H-A-M-A-N. Yes, sir. And you got that podcast on uh, American uh, at the, uh, the <laughs> what's this? Uh, you, I got on Forbidden, Forbidden Truth, Truth Academy. Academy. Yeah, you got me all you, confused. Yeah, you can find a Forbidden Truth podcast on Forbidden Truth Academy. You can also find all of our free courses, and you can also find all of uh, the interviews, the big interviews that I've done, which I would encourage everybody to check out. Well, what's your, what's your favorite interviews you want people to look for? Well, we have a we have some really big ones that are up there. Um, I think the recent one that I did with um, um, Anna Perez, it's only like a half an hour, and there's some pretty – mind-blowing information in there if you're looking for a shorter interview if you're looking for a longer form interview you know there's some on there uh i did one with michael uh knowles that's really really good i also did another one with alex jones it's pretty good as well um but uh it really all depends on the flavor we have i think uh i also did one with michael malice um i I've, i've done a lot of you know, big name interviews recently that I think anybody and everybody that's interested in what I've said here should go and check out. How about the Fox News one you did with that guy? I forget his name at the moment, but uh, how'd you feel about that one? I didn't do anyone with Fox News. You know, what I'm talking about the guy. Uh, he just got fired from Fox. I never did an interview with Tucker Carlson. His people have not reached out. Really? I thought you did. Nope. He he. And, and and this is this is the thing right. about media people. He I don't know if he was trying if he really is sympathetic to my plight because he hasn't reached out since I got out of prison to do an interview. I've had lots of my uh, people on Twitter be like, hey, when are you going to do it? Hey, Tucker, mm-hmm. when are you going to do this interview? You know, and the, his people haven't reached out, you know, but he's willing to fly to Romania to interview Andrew Tate. But he can't come to Phoenix, Arizona to interview me, the person that he broke the story about, the person he said he feels sorry for Hmm. it to me it's just like okay bud well maybe maybe we'll see one in the future i don't know that's really up to him and you're still on a supervised release right that is correct are there restrictions on on you against doing uh, interviews travel that kind of stuff no i just can't travel outside the state without po's permission so um until that is lifted i have to stay here in arizona and how long will that continue I don't know. Maybe in the next couple of months. Oh. It really all depends on what my PO says about, you know, when I can leave the state, you know, if it's for work or pleasure or whatever. So likely it will be for work, but we'll see. Jake, Angeli, thank you so much. Thank you. Good night. Good night. <laughs>